Well, I've got to say I've been surprised at the amount of feedback that we've gotten from this series. There's, there's been a number of individuals that have said how much they've really enjoyed jumping into this, this series, Twisted Truths, and uh, enjoyed learning really what we need to know in terms of understanding and interpreting the Bible. And I really, really think it's important to train Christians to read and study Scripture on their own. And for us as a church, really, that's a part of our, our mission. It's a part of our purpose as a church to make passionate followers of Jesus Christ, to help people grow deeper in God's Word. And really, it also falls in line with one of our core values, which is God's Word, that we seek to know, live, and proclaim the Gospel. And we can't do that without understanding and knowing how to interpret Scripture within its context. Well, by way of review, I want to give you just a couple of things to, to once again think about as we dive into this. Speaking of interpretation and context, I want to look at those two terms. Interpretation of a passage, we said, is, is what the original author, inspired by God, intended to communicate to the original recipients. In other words, who wrote it, who received it, and what was the original intent of the passage? When we talked about context, we said context is that which goes before and that which follows after it. You know, as we look at a particular verse like we've done each of the last couple of weeks and we'll do again this morning, we need to look at what comes before and what comes after the passage. And, and we said this, we must know the context of a passage in order to have the proper interpretation of a verse. We have to know the context. Uh, Kevin Botter in his book, Baptist Distinctives, gives really three simply, I think, really great statements about interpret, interpreting the Bible. It says this, allow the Bible to interpret itself by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And we've talked about that each week, really the importance of taking Scripture and using Scripture to interpret Scripture. Number two, he says this, allow teaching passages to interpret historical passages. I think that's a great statement, and I really want you to catch that, okay? We, we, we don't base uh, our theology necessarily off of historical passages, but more on teaching passages. In other words, if you take the book of Acts, and I've mentioned the book of Acts a couple of times now, it's more of a historical book. And we allow teaching passages to help us understand those historical passages. For instance, a few weeks ago when I talked about baptism, there's a lot of verses about baptism, but I, I didn't primarily land on a lot of verses from the book of Acts necessarily because those are more historical in nature where they're describing what took place in the first century with the early church. And I used more of the teaching passages to, to uh, really define where we stand as a church in terms of our, our position with baptism. And then number three, allow clear passages to interpret obscure passages. passages. And I think that's a great statement as well, right? Because there are times when there's texts that we come across that might be a little more difficult for us to understand. And we need to go to clear passages that clearly talk about some of those same things and dive into those in order to understand, better understand obscure passages. When we were in the book of 1 Peter, we came across in particular, there was one really obscure passage and we had to go back and dive into a number of other texts in order to really understand what Peter was talking about there in 1 Peter. So those are three great statements that I, that I would encourage you. If you want to write those down, take a picture of the slide, go ahead and do that. But we encourage you to make sure you understand those. Allow the Bible to interpret itself. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Allow teaching passages to interpret historical passages. And allow clear passages to interpret obscure passages. And this goes really hand in hand with what we, what we mentioned that Barnhouse said. You very rarely have to go outside of the Bible to explain anything in the Bible. And really, I know a number of you said, man, that quote was just fantastic. It really helped me grab a hold of what we're talking about. And I wanted to give that to you once again. You very rarely have to go outside of the Bible to explain anything in the Bible. And last, by way of review, all Scripture has only one interpretation but multiple applications. And, th and that's very true, right? When we talk about interpretation, um, there's only one interpretation, but multiple applications. And so as we talk about that today, we're going to go to our text. It's Isaiah chapter 53. It's on page 356 if you're using one of the Bibles under the chairs around you. Isaiah 53 really is one of the more familiar passages, especially in the book of Isaiah. And in the chapter itself is one of the more widely referenced chapters uh, when it comes to prophecy. 
It's a chapter that points to the death of Jesus, which really is going to lead right into uh, our, our time of communion this morning. But as we think about the death of Jesus, this passage really talks a lot about the death of Jesus, his crucifixion, and the suffering that he endured as the suffering servant leading to the cross. So the one particular verse that I want to take a look at is verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 53. It says this, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. The, the question with this verse, really, that we're going to look at falls on that final phrase, with his wounds or by his wounds we are healed. And more specifically, the question falls to, to the idea of, of what this healing is. Is it a spiritual healing? Is it a physical healing? Is it both? And there's, there's people who interpret that differently. And, and really, I want to use this as another example of how we can dive into Scripture and how we can clearly understand how to interpret this verse by the context in which it is given, okay? So with that in mind, let's, let's take a moment and let's go to the Lord in prayer before we dive into this. God, as we come before you today, we're so thankful for your word, and we're thankful for, for the things that we've just mentioned, Lord, that, that we can use scripture to interpret scripture, and that we can, we rarely have to go outside of the Bible to understand it, and Lord, we're thankful for, uh, Lord, just the, the power and authority of the Word of God in our lives. And Lord, as, as we dive into this text this morning, I pray and ask that you just uh, just work in our hearts, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to see clearly, uh, Lord, the, the, the context and interpretation of this verse. And uh, Lord, as well, that you would just help us to continue to grow in our knowledge and in our ability to be able to study the Word of God on our own. Lord, I, I just ask and pray that you'd work in each heart I pray for those who aren't followers of Christ, Lord, that they would really recognize the power of the Savior who died and rose again. And Lord, for those of us who are followers of Christ, Lord, we pray that once again we be reminded of what you endured on our behalf, of your willingness to send the Son and the willingness of the Son to die on the cross to pay for our sin. Lord, we are humbled by that truth and by that reality. And with that in mind, Lord, we come before you today. We study your word and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Isaiah 53, verse 5. Well, first, we, we want to understand what we are looking at as we jump into the book of Isaiah. Uh, who's the author? Well, the author is Isaiah, the son of Amos. And in Isaiah, or Isaiah, the name Isaiah means uh, Yahweh is salvation. And I think that's, that's really cool because as we look at this passage here in Isaiah chapter 53, really it points to salvation. Um, most likely, Isaiah, he probably resided in, in Jerusalem. Uh, the recipient was mainly the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, it was written approximately 700 B.C., 700 years before the birth of Christ. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and the importance of that. The type of book, it's prophecy. It's a prophecy book. And the purpose was to remind his readers of their relationship with God as a nation. And that's important to think about, right? Isaiah is calling the people back to their covenantal relationship with God. He's reminding them of their sin and that they too would follow the same course that the northern kingdom of Israel had followed. They were already in captivity, and he's reminding them, listen, if you go the same route, if you continue down the same path, the exact same thing that happened to the northern kingdom is going to happen to you as well. And similar to what we mentioned back in week one with this, with, with Jeremiah, was the people thought, no, never, it's never going to happen. Uh, there's, there's no way the city of Jerusalem will ever fall. It's not going to take place. And so with that, they continued down the same road they were going. He's also writing, in a sense, to those who would eventually end up in exile to encourage them that God would restore them as a nation. Um, the book of Isaiah it is part of the, the great archaeological find called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you might have heard that phrase before. Um, in the late 1940s and throughout the 1950s, there's an incredible find of Dead Sea Scrolls found at Qumran. And I've been to that location. It's now a national park in Israel where they have found many, many, many copies of Old Testament writings. And actually, they found the entire um, portion of, of Isaiah. And specifically, they have Isaiah chapter 53, every word of it. 
And I, and I want you to grab a hold of that and the importance of that because it was written 700 years prior to the birth of Christ. And even these Dead Sea Scrolls that were found were written before the birth of Christ. All right? Long before Jesus was born, those Dead Sea Scrolls were written. So they're very clear prophecies that were given. And even the copies that have been found through archaeology were written before the birth of Christ. Um, since they originally found some of these first manuscripts, they've since found about 900 manuscripts there. 900. And, and you know what's neat about archaeology? Every time there's an archaeological find, it further proves the Word of God. It further proves the validity of the Bible. There has never been an archaeological find that disproved the Word of God. And I want you to understand that because there's been thousands and thousands of archaeological digs and finds, and they always prove the validity of the Bible. And so with that in mind, I want you to grab a hold of that and the importance of this find, and, and the importance really because... It's a book of prophecy, and Isaiah 53 is one of the great prophecies in regards to the death of Jesus and what he would endure and what he would go through. So, well, this portion of Isaiah, as I mentioned, it's perhaps the best known section in the book of Isaiah. And several parts of this passage, even in Isaiah chapter 53, are quoted in the New Testament. Um, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 15, is quoted in Romans 15. Isaiah 53, 1 is quoted in John 12, 38, in Romans 10, 16. Isaiah 53, 4 is quoted in Matthew 8, 17. Isaiah 53, 7 and 8 are quoted in Acts 8, 32 and 33. And Isaiah 53, 9, it's quoted in 1 Peter 2, 22. And Isaiah 53, 12, it's quoted in Luke 20, 22, 37. And that's not all of them. I could keep going. But I want, just want you to catch how critical this passage is because it is referenced many, many times throughout the New Testament. And the section that we're looking at in Isaiah 53 is towards the end of the book of, of Isaiah. And towards the end of the book of Isaiah, it's talking about the restoration that would take place. And it would take place through this suffering servant that Isaiah references. And it's specifically talking about Jesus, very clearly talking about Jesus. And most of this passage concerns the suffering, the rejection of the suffering servant. But the main point is that his suffering will lead to exaltation and glory. And I want you to catch that because we're going to see that. His suffering leads to exaltation and glory. Um, what's interesting is you back up, if you back up even further, I'm not going to go into detail with it, but in Isaiah chapter 49 and 50, we see how the servant was rejected. And then chapter 51, the beginning of chapter 52, we see the remnant was exalted. And then we look at the end of chapter 52 and into chapter 53, we begin to see how the, the servant, Jesus, was to be exalted. Take a look at Isaiah chapter 52. In the end of the chapter, verse 13 says this, Behold, my servant, catch that word servant, shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Now, now, you need to understand this is not talking about the cross yet, but it's talking about how God will exalt him. As many, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond whom, human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. In the Old Testament, the, the, the Old Testament priests would sprinkle blood for cleansing, for purification. And it uses that word here to talk about Really what Christ would do. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. What we are about to see through this passage is exaltation takes place through humility. And that's backwards. I mean, in society today, like that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But as you follow Scripture and as you study Scripture, you see time and time again that when there's exaltation prior to that comes humility. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit, right? Talk about the idea of humility, being poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are the humble. They are the ones who are exalted, right? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says this, Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. This is, this is one of the verses I've, I've tried to, 
talk time and time and time again with my kids. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time, He may exalt you. I want you to catch, exaltation comes through humility. And when Jesus went to the cross, He would humble Himself. In fact, I think one of the most beautiful passages that really uh, really draws out this idea comes from, from the writings of Paul in the book of Philippians chapter 2, where it says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Talk about humility. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself, the choice of Christ, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Verse 9 goes on, it says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Christ humbled himself. The Father exalts Christ. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbles himself. God the Father highly exalted the Son, Jesus, which brings us back to Isaiah 53, right? You need to catch the idea of exaltation. It comes through humility. Well, back to Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1, it says this. Who has believed? We talk about context. We want to back up and see what comes before. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of, the, out, of the dry, out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 2 states that, that he grew up like a young plant, or maybe your Bible interprets it, a, a young shoot. And this word shoot actually goes back to Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11 where it says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch that will bear fruit. This connects the humble servant, right? That he's going to be a descendant of, of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. And the word shoot was often used for someone who was a king. It's, it's pointing to the coming Messiah. It says in verse, verse 2 that he had no form or majesty, no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus didn't fit the look of a king. All right? All right? It, it wasn't, don't, don't read those verses and, and, and think the idea of ugly. Just think the idea of he didn't fit the look of a king. He had no form or majesty. It wasn't clearly like you look at him like, man, that guy's clearly pretty important. You didn't have that thought when you saw Jesus. He didn't fit the look of a king. He, he wasn't someone that people thought would be a king. I mean, the, pro, the problem was Jesus didn't come to be a political king. And that's what they were looking for. Verse 3 says this, He was despised and rejected by men. Jesus was rejected uh, specifically here as we think about the, the religious leaders rejected him, right? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. The religious leaders didn't think he was important. He just got in their way. He caused problems for them. He made them look bad, right? Woe to you. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, he called them out right in the temple court. He made them look bad so that he was despised and he was rejected and was not accepted as the Messiah. They didn't want anything to do with him. They wanted to kill him. Verse 4 says, Surely, and this is where it really changes, the, the pattern of this chapter begins to change, surely he has borne our griefs. And it's going to get personal, right? About what? what the suffering servant would do for us. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. With verse 4, we start to see the servant's substitutionary death. He borne or he bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. People said that Jesus 
at, at that point that he died because he blasphemed God, right? The religious leaders wanted to mock him, calling him the king of the Jews, but in all reality, Jesus was bearing our sin at the cross, dying in our place, taking the penalty for our sin, right? And then we come to verse 5, for, our verse for today. It says this, but he was pierced. Thinking about his hands, his feet, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. The question that some have is, is what type of healing takes place? With his wounds, we are healed. Is it only spiritual or is it more? Bible Knowledge Commentary says this, ironically, his wounds inflicted by the soldiers' scourging, and which were followed by his death, are the means of healing believers' spiritual wounds in salvation. Catch that. Jesus' physical agony in the crucifixion was great and intense, but his obedience to the Father was what counted. His death satisfied the wrath of God against sin and allows him to overlook the sins of the nation and of others who believe because they have been paid for by the servant's substitutionary death. Spiritual wounds in salvation. The context of Isaiah 53 is the spiritual healing that comes through the suffering of Christ. The substitutionary death of the suffering servant. Remember, context is, is that which comes before and that which comes after. I want to read the rest of the chapter. Don't worry, it's not long. But I want you to really think about context. What have we read so far in Isaiah chapter 53 and of chapter 52? What is it pointing to? And what did we say here as we look at verse 5? That the wounds that are talked about in the end of that verse are spiritual. Does that fit in the rest of the context of the chapter? Listen to verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. That's why Jesus died. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He made a way for us to be able to go to God. We couldn't do it on our own. It was only through the sacrifice of Christ he died to bring spiritual healing. And some want to point to how Jesus performed miracles. Well, he, he did all these miracles. He healed all these people saying that that was a sign of his physical healing for his followers. Listen, it was more of a sign for people to recognize this really is the Messiah. 
His, listen to this quote. His, heal, his healing many people's physical illnesses, though not all of them, take, make sure you take note of that, in his earthly ministry anticipated his greater work on the cross. Though he does heal physical ailments today, though not all of them, his greater work is healing souls, giving salvation from sin. That is the subject of Isaiah 53. It's clear from the words. Transgressions, verse 5. Iniquities, verse 5 and 11. Iniquity, verse 6. Transgressions, verse 8. Wicked, verse 9. Transgressors, twice in verse 12. In sin, verse 12. From what we have learned over the course of the last few weeks about context, as we look at Isaiah chapter 53, the context is clearly spiritual healing. That's why we see all of these terms pop up over and over and over again. Iniquity, transgression, transgressors, sin. By his wounds we are healed, spiritually speaking. That is what brings about salvation. And when we have accepted His gift of salvation, we're declared righteous before God. And we have seen and we've talked about this time and time and time again that as we look at passages, we need to see the overall context of what's being communicated. And clearly, it's about spiritual healing in Isaiah 53. There isn't wording that points to physical healing as we go through this chapter. Well, what we've also mentioned as we've gone through this series is that we need to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And I, and I mentioned there's a number of, of verses throughout Isaiah 53 that are talked about in the New Testament. I just want to look specifically at one text that talks exactly about this phrase that we're looking at in Isaiah 53.5. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and see if the context in 1 Peter 2 matches what we've observed in Isaiah chapter 53. And if we see the same context in 1 Peter as we do in Isaiah 53, we can gather that we've interpreted the text properly. If you were here with us last, last year, most of last year, we went through the book of 1 Peter, verse by verse, word by word through 1 Peter. And uh, in, the, in the summer, last, last summer, we did a series called Submission Possible. And there's a, a section in the middle of, of 1 Peter that talks about submission. And Peter gives a number of scenarios where submission <clears throat> may be difficult, but it's possible. And he comes down and then he gives this example of submitting to the Father's will that Christ did at the cross. And he says this in 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 21. For to this you have been called, to this idea of submission, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Listen to these next few verses. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. And then notice verse 25. For you were strained like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Our souls are what need healing, what needs healing more than anything else. He heals souls. And once again, the context of 1 Peter 2 matches the context in the interpretation from Isaiah 53, confirming that the healing is spiritual healing. In fact, as you read part of 1 Peter 2, you can't help but think of what we just read in Isaiah chapter 53 and the similarities and the references. Now, listen, I, I know... Probably many of you are thinking, Pastor Ben, probably pretty much all of us, maybe all of us in the room, already really recognize what you're saying about Isaiah chapter 53, that it's about spiritual healing. But could you have walked someone through these texts and explained to them why it is about spiritual healing? See, one of the goals, as we've mentioned throughout the series, is for you to be able to 
study the word, study the text, and in properly interpret the text so that you can, as we talk about with our, perp- as our, with our purpose statement, right, make passionate followers of Jesus Christ so that you can explain to others how they can study and properly interpret the scripture as well. And hopefully this serves to to further strengthen your ability to properly interpret the Bible as we've gone through these. I want to say a couple things about healing, specifically physical healing. And I don't have time to get into all this. I I could spend a couple more messages, all right, talking about this idea. I don't have time to to dive into it. But first of all, I want to say this. Do, do, Do I believe that God... Uh, has done miracles and can do miracles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that, that he can uh, miraculously heal people. Absolutely he can. Um, but without diving uh, really into my position on, on miracles, on, on healing, we must recognize that miracles are the exception to the rule. Okay. In fact, even if you were to go through the Bible cover to cover, there's huge gaps throughout Scripture where there are no miracles. Huge portions. In fact, where miracle, miracles do take place, it's, it's pretty seldom. And even, even if you study the life of, of the Apostle Paul, right? And think about the Apostles, right? When, when Jesus was here, there was miracles that were done, but he didn't heal everybody. All right? We need to recognize that. It's not why he came came to be the Messiah to save people from sin, to rescue them from sin. But even as Christ left and returned to heaven after his death and resurrection, you had the apostles that early on in the beginning of their ministry, in the beginning of the church, they performed miracles. But the further you go into the life of the apostles, think about the apostle Paul, right? That there was miracles that took place early on, very early on, miracles that would take place, where whether it was with his handkerchief, that the people touch his handkerchief and they're healed. But by the time you come to the end of his ministry, there's clearly sickness, and he talks about sickness, and he talks about how he wished he could do something, but he really doesn't have that ability anymore. What took place? Well, the reality is miracles don't happen in the Bible nearly as often as we think they do. And we need to understand that miraculous healing. Though I do think that God can do anything, right? We need to understand what we believe about the character of God, that He can do anything, that it happens not nearly as often as we think that it does. I love what MacArthur says about this passage um, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and Isaiah 53. He says this, Both Isaiah and Peter meant the wounds of Jesus that were part of the execution process. Wounds is a general reference, a synonym for all the suffering that brought Him to death. And the healing here is spiritual, not physical. Neither Isaiah nor Peter intended physical healing as the result in these references to Christ's suffering. It goes on. Physical healing for all who believe does result from Christ's atoning work. But, but, such healing awaits a future realization in the perfections of heaven. In resurrection glory, believers will experience no sickness, pain, suffering, or death. In fact, it says this in Revelation 21. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband, and heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall they bring mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. We, we need to recognize that, yes, physical healing is a part of what took place with the death of Christ, but it's yet to come. It's yet to come. And what the death of Jesus brought, more importantly than physical healing, is spiritual healing. 
Spiritual healing transcends this life. It's the next. It's for eternity. See, see even if, if we have physical ailments in this life and we're miraculously healed, I hate to break it to you, but at some point you're still going to die, all right? At some point, our bodies still break down. And it's temporary. But the spiritual healing that Christ offers through salvation is for eternity. It's not temporary. As, as we think about this, I recognize that some of you, you're going through situations where you're, you're probably praying for some physical healing, right? I, Travis, man, I, I saw you come in this morning at, Thought it took you almost 10 minutes to come down the aisle here to get to your seat, right? But you're here. But I can tell, I can tell that you're in a lot of pain today, right? We need to pray for our brother's healing. But it's probably going to be some physical therapy involved, is my guess. It's probably going to be a difficult road. But we need to pray for you. And if God miraculously intervenes on our brother's behalf, praise God. That's awesome. Travis is like, that'd be great, right? But if not, he's still God. He's still on the throne. And there's a day coming when for eternity, you're not going to feel that pain. You know, it's funny, I just read that there'll be no more tears, right? But we see people struggle, don't we? We see people go through difficulties with, physic, with physical illnesses and struggles. And I want to encourage you as you pray for people, as you pray for their healing, you continue to do that, don't give up, but recognize God's sovereignty in all of it. Recognize that we live in a fallen world. And recognize that a day is coming when that prayer will be answered. Whether it's in this life or the life to come. As we look at this text, the context is very clearly spiritual healing. That the suffering that Christ endured was so that we could have salvation. That's why he suffered. And as we saw both in Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter 2, the death of Jesus was substitutionary. Jesus in my place. Jesus, he himself died in my place. This, this, this was a choice by Jesus. We saw that in Philippians chapter 2. He submitted himself to the Father's will, voluntarily placing himself under the will of God. And when we accept this understanding of what Christ did, and when we come to the reality of how amazing this is, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, our prayer for you is that you would realize what Christ did for you at the cross. That He died in your place. Paul says in Romans 6 that the wages of sin, the penalty, the earnings of our sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus went to the cross to pay for your sin. He died in your place so that you could have eternal life. And if you're not a follower of Christ, the question is, will you accept his substitutionary death in your behalf? You've probably heard me say many, many times, invite Jesus to be the leader of your life and the forgiver of your sin. Will you accept the salvation that he freely offers? That Christ went to the cross 
He died to pay for your sin. For those of us who are followers of Christ, we're going to take some time in just a couple of minutes to have communion, to remember the sacrifice. It it is humbling to consider the God of the universe being willing to die in my place. Communion offers us this time to be able to remember the sacrifice of Christ and what he did, to remember his substitutionary death in our place, that he bore our sufferings, our griefs, our transgressions, and sins, iniquities, as we saw in Isaiah chapter 53, in our place on the cross. As we think about that, I'm just going to have a word of prayer. And, and I just want to, before I pray, I want to give you just a moment of silence just to consider the death of Christ and how incredible it is, how amazing and spectacular it is that the God of the universe would die for you, would die for me of all people. And that you'd consider salvation by grace through faith and all that that means. And that you'd even consider what that salvation means for eternity. So with that, I'll just take a moment and give you an opportunity to to talk to the Lord, to make sure your heart's right with Him, and then I'll pray. Lord, as we come before you, as we have this this time to remember the death of your son, we're thankful for the healing that you brought. We're thankful for the intercession that you made so that we could have a relationship with you. God, as we think about healing, Lord, certainly we all have people in our lives that we love and care about dearly. We see them struggle. We see them go through difficulties physically. And Lord, we lift them before you, asking God that you would just grant them some relief. And we do pray that you would bring about healing. But Lord, whether you answer that prayer in this life or in the one to come, we trust you. We trust you with our loved ones. We trust you with the agony that they're enduring. But we do that because of what your son endured on our behalf. We know the promises that we have from your word of what's to come. And we look forward to that. We look forward to glorification. But until then, God, we ask and pray that you would remind us Most importantly, the spiritual healing that is brought through the cross. We're thankful for the death of Jesus. We're thankful for his willingness to take on all the junk of our lives. We're humbled by that. And so as we come now and have this opportunity to remember... We say thank you. Thank you for sending your son. And to our Savior, thank you for your willingness to be 
one to take away our sin. The one to take our place. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. I would ask that you take your communion cups at this time. In Isaiah, or in Isaiah, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about communion and the importance of it. And last month we, we dove into this text a whole lot further than we will this morning. But Paul talks about the, the final night of the life of Jesus. And he says this in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, For I see, receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And it says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. The bread, the cracker that you have in front of you, causes us to remember the body of Christ that was broken, that was beaten. Beaten to the point where it was unrecognizable. So as we take this, we remember the body of Christ that was broken for us. It says, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Take the cracker. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As we think about the sacrifice of Christ, as we think about all that he's done for us, Take a look at the screen there in the words from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Would you read this out loud with me? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me.